Good day. I'm Gary Elston. I'm pastor at the Lagoda United Methodist Church. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Well, I hope you're doing well as we continue to struggle with the coronavirus. We have no stay-at-home order now, but I hope you're staying at home as much as you can. And while you're staying at home, please contact other folks. Let them know you care, and then tell them how you feel. If you're out, please practice physical distancing. Stay six feet from everybody. One Indiana corn stalker, seven Indiana tenderloins. Hope you're listening to and reading our communications that come out. We're trying not to overwhelm you with communications, although you'll be getting some this week, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. If you'd like to be on our email list, please email us at lagodeumc at gmail.com. That's L-O-O-G-O-O-T-E-E-U-M-C at gmail.com. Our phone number is 812-295-3049. I hope you're enjoying the daily devotionals we send out. And I know that we would normally gather our prayer requests now as we worship, but obviously we cannot do that. So please continue to send in your prayer requests. We will uh, publish those on Monday with our regular Monday newsletter. And I hope you continue to pray. Pray for yourself and pray for this church. Pray for our community and our state and our nation and our world. Well, we've got another week or so of uh, where our building is closed to most activities. Our office is open pretty much normal hours now. Uh, other than that, we're closed aside from the food pantry. Um, please uh, help us with our food pantry. We could use some more work. I know you saw um, the daily devotional on Friday where it showed all of our bags of food, and that's where we need a lot of help bagging food for folks. This is an extra step because of the COVID virus. So please, if you can spare an hour or two to help us in our food pantry, we'd really appreciate that. Most of the other things in the building are closed, although we'll begin to talk about that at the end of the sermon or after the sermon is over. We'll talk more about that later. I do want to mention the Balloon family. They're still here. I'm glad they're still here. I also want to remind you of the offering. And I, I know it's really difficult and no pastor wants to stand, stand up here during a pandemic and say, yeah, it's time to give an offering. But it is time to give an offering. Uh, we try and make it as easy as we can. We use auto withdrawal. If you'd like to set that up through your bank, let us know. Let our office know. Or if you want to go on our website, there's a button on our homepage that says Give Plus, and you're welcome to go through that way too. Now, we know it's difficult, and if you can't give, we understand that. There are people who have lost their jobs or been cut way back, so we understand that. But because you give, we still support a lot of ministries. We still support the Henderson Settlement down in Kentucky, Frakes, Kentucky. And we go down there every year, and as far as I know, our, our October trip is still on, although we'll have to wait and see what the COVID virus does. We also still support the Indiana Youth Home down in Evansville. Now, we can do these things because you give. I thank you for your gifts. Would you join me in prayer, please? Lord, we give you thanks for all the gifts you've given to us, for our daily food and for our health, <laughs> for each breath we take, for freedom to choose the gift of your word and your power and your love. <clears throat> when we consider how you have, have, have entrusted us with so much, our hearts are truly overwhelmed. May we be worthy of that trust, God. May we be people who are, who are unafraid to live fully and as richly as you want us to live. Help us, O oh God, as followers of Jesus to multiply all that you've given us, to, to risk spreading the word and perhaps maybe even taking a gamble or two by loving those whom we think maybe don't deserve to be loved. But we know you do. Father, help us to be faith-filled and give us a desire to increase your glory and your goodness in this world. Make us people who, who share in both word and deed that which you have given to us. <clears throat> We pray for your church gathered today, <clears throat> gathered in their homes, watching now. We pray for your church gathered around your world. We pray that it continue to encourage its members and its communities. Help us use our gifts that you have given us for all the folks that you have given around us. God, this morning we pray for those who are who are feeling very poor in body and spirit. 
for those who may be oppressed, carrying a heavy burden, for those who are sick or in despair. Father, send your Holy Spirit, and and we know you already have. Have him minister to us by your Spirit and, and by us as well. Watch over all those whom we have prayed for and help us walk faithfully in the path that your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, showed us. And now in communion with the saints of your church, we pray that your prayer that your Son taught his disciples by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now it's time for some music.
Thank you. <clears throat> it's time for our scripture, and it's for this morning now. And the scripture comes out of the book of Acts, chapter 8, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Luke is writing. Luke is a writer of Acts. He writes, In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach, until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And he replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Do you join me in prayer, please? Father, let these be your thoughts that pass through my lips, into our hearts and out through our hands and feet. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Well, today we're going to study some of the last words of Jesus. Now, these are the last words of Jesus according to Luke. Jesus has already been crucified and resurrected. And now he's talking to the apostles, and, and we read verses 1 through 8. In verse 9, Jesus is taken up. He ascends into heaven. So according to Luke, these are the last words to Jesus' apostles while they were on earth. Last words are always important, and I think it's important that we study Jesus' last words. And to do that, we're going to break down this last verse, verse 8, in many different sections. And we're going to talk about what they each mean for us. It's kind of an exegetical way to preach, breaking it down, telling about what it means. So here is that verse 8, and I've written it in a different form to help you later as we deconstruct this verse. When the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And again, these are Jesus' last words, so they're very important. So let's start a deconstruction here. This first phrase, when the Holy Spirit comes, well... Jesus knew he had to leave. Jesus, Jesus died and was resurrected. He had to leave. He was going to be with his Father in heaven. And he was going to send the paraclete, or the guider, or the counselor, or the spirit to follow him and do later work. That's work with you and I. We work with the spirit. And it's notice the scripture doesn't say if the Holy Spirit comes. Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes. It's not conditional it's a promise. The Holy Spirit has already come at, at Pentecost, and he's already come for you. You have access to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is within you. It's not if, it's when. When the Holy Spirit comes, 
you will receive power. Notice, first of all, again, it's not if you receive power. You will receive power. It's not a condition. It's a promise. A promise that the Holy Spirit will give you power. The Holy Spirit is already here. You have access to that power. Now, let me talk about power for just a minute. Jesus didn't say you will receive energy. He said you will receive power. There's a difference between energy and power. And being a, here comes, a nerdy engineer, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between energy and power. And I promise this physics class will just last a little bit. I didn't like physics anyway, so I know I'm going to keep it short. But I want to teach you just a couple of differences between energy and power. Here they are. Energy is directionless, powerless, power is directed. Energy has potential, power accomplishes something. Now, now before you other nerds get on me, I know I've oversimplified and overstated this a whole bunch. But bear with me and just follow through with me with this. So to give you a little bit better picture of the difference, I want to paint you a word picture. And I want you to, this is scary for a pastor, but I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. Now I want you to picture a playground in an elementary school and you've got 36 year olds running around the playground. It's a beautiful spring day, the flowers are out, the trees are blooming, the sun is shining, and you have these 30 kids running around an elementary school playground. Now, you can guess there's a lot of energy on that playground, right? But it's all going different directions. You've seen 30 kids on a playground. They don't all do the same thing. They're all going in different directions. They've got lots of energy. Energy is directionless. <clears throat> now, take those 30 kids in your mind and put them in a line, one behind each other. And in their hands, they're holding a tug of war rope. And on the, the other end of the rope, see 30 kids are on one side, on the other end of the rope is the one teacher. Five foot flat, 84 pounds. So right now the kids have energy, they have potential energy. They're going to have a tug of war with the teacher, and they're going to try and beat the teacher at the tug of war. They have this potential. Okay, continue the picture. And the principal drops the handkerchief and the tug of war starts. And because 30 children have more power than one 100 pound teacher soaking wet, they win. They, they work and they pull and they pull and they finally pull the teacher over and they win. Their power was directed in one way. They were trying to beat the teacher at tug of war. And because they had more power than the teacher, they accomplished their task. So I want to say energy is directionless and power is directed. The kids had directed power to beat the teacher. And energy has potential, but power accomplishes something. They actually did beat the teacher. Now, what power accomplishes, according to physicists, is work. Okay, I'm done with physics class, by the way, now. So we have work. When the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power. That means we're going to have a direction and we're going to have a work to do. And Jesus brings up what our work is going to do in the next segment. When your Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. You know what a witness is, right? You've all seen TV shows, crime shows, law shows, where somebody is on a witness stand. What do they do? They tell their story. That's it. They tell what they saw. They tell what they experienced. They tell their story. That's what Jesus wants us to do, to tell our story, our story of how we relate to him and how he relates to us and what that has meant in our life. We, all we have to do is tell our story. We don't have to make anything up. We don't have to be grand and glorious theologians. We just have to tell people what Jesus meant to us in our story. And, and we may not be doctors of theology. In fact, most of us are not, me included. All we have to do is tell our story. That's being a witness. And notice, Jesus doesn't say we're going to convert people. 
Because quite frankly, the work of converting people to Christianity is work done by the Holy Spirit. All we're to do is witness. That's easy for us to do. We can tell our story because we've lived it. We know it. We don't have to use cue cards. We're to be as witnesses telling our story. So that's the work we're supposed to do. Now, where does the direction come in? Well, it starts in the next phrase. When the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So where was Jerusalem? Well, it was the city that the apostles spent some time in with Jesus. It was actually the center of the Judaic faith and all of those folks are Jewish. So it was the center of their faith where they spent some time, where they celebrated and worshiped God in the temple. So where would that be for us? Do we have to go to the temple? No, the temple isn't the center of our faith. Well, do we have to go to the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C.? No. Where's the center of our faith? Well, for those of us here, it's Lagoda United Methodist Church. This is where we practice our faith. This is the center of our faith. So we're supposed to be sharing and witnessing here in Lagoda United Methodist Church or whatever church you happen to go to. Well, why would we need to do that? They already know us. Exactly. They know you. They've got some story kind of like yours. At least the ending is like yours where they've accepted Jesus. It should be easy to share your story with people at the Lagoda United Methodist Church or whatever church you go to. Because they all think like you. They all believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So sharing our story to them isn't telling them anything new. It's not really doing that. It's practicing for what comes later. You see, when John Wesley started the Methodist movement, he would have classes. And every week a class would meet and they would have to answer the question, how is it with your soul? Now a modern day take on that question would be, where have you seen God lately acting in your life? Well, if you knew you were going to get asked that question every week, wouldn't you start really looking for God every week and probably finding God somewhere, realizing what God was doing in your life every week? And then you would go to the meeting and you'd tell them, and it would just get easier and easier and easier. Through all that practice, that telling of your story, that witnessing will get easier. And here's, here's a little side bonus. To people who were new, who had just started coming to the class, they would see people and they would see or hear them tell their story. They would hear them witnessing. Where was God at that week in their life? And they would begin to see that's part of the DNA. And don't you think maybe the next week before they came to the meeting, they would start thinking about, well, where did I see Jesus and God in, in this week? So that's the double bonus here. Not only are you getting better at telling your story, getting better at witnessing, new people see that and know it's part of our DNA. So notice the size of that yellow circle up there right now. Because that's going to get just a little bit different as we continue to move on down through what Jesus is talking about. So back to the scripture. When the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem throughout Judea. Oh, now, what's a Judea? Without going into a lot of history, I like history too, I'm not just a nerd for science. Without going through a lot of history, Judea is the area around Jerusalem. It's really small. It's, it's not very big at all, but it would be probably a quarter of the state of Indiana. That would be Judea. And it's, it's the size where two of the kingdoms or two of the tribes settled before they split into two kingdoms, the north and south kingdom, Israel and Judah. So Judah is the area around Jerusalem, down in the Dead Sea area. And it's, it's where uh, the people lived. It's friends and family were there. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, while it's not the heart of Jerusalem or the heart of Judaism, Ju Jerusalem is, there was a lot of people living in that area who, who knew each other, who were friends, who were acquaintances. So where is our Judea? Our Judea is our family and friends. I mean, geographically, it might be Lagodi or Shoals or Martin County or Davis County or wherever you live. But if you take away the geography, it's your family and friends. Who do you hang out with? 
Who do you like being around? These people, these are people you like. And I know some of you may question that about some of your family, but let's be honest. You really like people you hang around. So that's your Judea. It's, it's not difficult. This is not rocket science. Judea is the people that you hang around. Your family, your friends. Maybe it's the, the parents of some of your kids in their sports activities or dance or whatever it might be they're in. It's the people you know and like. That's pretty simple. So let's go back to what Jesus says next. When the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria. And I can tell you right then, the disciples wanted to stop listening. Because they were thinking, no, I'm not going to tell people in Samaria about you. Okay, now, so again, we need a little history lesson here. Samaria was the area just north of Judea. And, and quite frankly, the Jews disliked, detested, hated the Samaritans. They really thought the Samaritans were half-breeds. They were actually originally some Jewish folks who had, uh, according to the Judean Samaritan, Judean, Jude, who, Judean Jews, they kind of left Jewishness. They intermarried, they did some things, and, and you know, even the, the Jews thought the heathens were more, Christian, more uh, religious than the Samaritans because they said the Samaritans thought they were religious, but really weren't. They did not like the Samaritans. So Jesus saying, oh, now you've got to be my witnesses in Samaria. Nah. In fact, the, the hatred was so much that there was a saying, do not let your shadow fall on Samaritan soil. So, so let me explain that just a little bit. If you were a good Jew living up north in the Sea of Galilee, and you can see it up there uh, two-thirds of the way up, and you were going to go visit your cousin Yitzhak down in Jerusalem, you see Jerusalem is in red on that map, there are really two directions you could go, or two paths you could take. The first one is straight. The problem is, you see that arrow, it runs right over Samaria. That's the path that a good Jew would not take because you're not supposed to let your shadow fall on Samaritan soil. A good Jew would cross over just south of the Sea of Galilee, come down the east side of the uh, Jordan River, cut back off, across at Jericho, and then go to Jerusalem. Now that added about a day each way to the trip. But the hatred was so much. But Jesus said to his apostles, you're to be my witness in Samaria. <clears throat> and we know some did. We know Philip went to Samaria. We know others went to Samaria. So my question to you is, where is your Samaria? Well, let me, let me ask it a little different way. I think it's going to be easier if we think about it as who we would not want having here at church. Who do we not want singing in the choir or taking care of kids in the nursery? or a Pioneer Club? Who do we not want sitting around a Sunday school with us? And, and I know, you've probably got some individual names, and I don't want to know them, please don't email them. But there are probably groups of people that you wouldn't necessarily want here at church. And I, I don't know what they might be. Addicts, alcoholics, homosexuals, whatever it might be, I don't know. But your Samaria are those people. In other words, it's the people you don't like. Yeah. The ones that you don't want coming here to church. Yeah, you're supposed to witness to them too. And you're thinking, Pastor Gary, I don't want to do that. I know. I know. Pastor Gary, I don't think I can do that. I know that too. Do you remember how this verse starts? When the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power. You see, it doesn't take a lot of power to be a witness for Jesus in your Jerusalem, in your church, your church family. It doesn't take a lot of power to be a witness for Jesus in your Judea, your family, your friends, the people you hang out with. But it takes a whole Holy Spirit's worth of power to witness for Jesus to somebody you don't like. Because without leaning on the Holy Spirit to do it, you won't do it. So that's why we need the Holy Spirit to help us witness. We rely on the Holy Spirit's power to witness to whomever we like, whomever we don't like. 
Yeah, I know. That's not one you want to hear. Neither did the disciples. And Jesus said it anyway. So now let's finish. When the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power and you'll be my witness in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Huh. The ends of the earth. Does that mean you're supposed to go to the ends of the earth? Well, the apostles went to the ends of the known earth. Some went to China, some went to India, some went to Africa. Places very, very far away. Does that mean that I'm telling you that you have to be a missionary to a faraway place? No, no, and no. If God wants you to be a missionary, he'll let you know that. So who are these ends of the earth people? Well, let's think about it this way. When the apostles went out, they didn't know those folks that they were going to go see, they were going to go witness to. So the people who are our ends of the earth are the people you don't know. Now, a lot of you have a lot of acquaintances and you have a lot of Facebook friends. I know, I've got more Facebook friends and I really know who they are. Do I expect you to be witness to all those people you don't know? Do I expect you to stand on the street corner and, and just witness to people as they walk by? No, please don't do that. What do you mean, witness to people you don't know? Well, here, here's what I, I mean by that. I think it's, to people you don't know yet. For instance, you go into a restaurant and your waitress comes up and takes your order and you don't know her. You're supposed to witness to her. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, you start by building relationships. Hey, how are you? Can we pray for you about anything? Let them see what you do. I'm not one here to stand here and just say, knock on doors. I don't want you to go knocking on doors, doing knock on door evangelism. But the people you don't know, you can begin developing relationships with. And that's how they become, they move either to someone you like or someone you don't. But we move them from people you don't know. So Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Yeah, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of places. But we receive power from the Holy Spirit to do those things. Now remember, power is energy that's directed and accomplishes work. Well, if we're witnessing, that's the work. But I want to look at the direction of our energy, of our power. Notice the circles kept getting bigger. So the direction of our work is pointed out, not in. That circle that was the Lagodi United Methodist Church was the smallest. The circle that was representing people we don't know was the largest. Our work is pointed that way. It's pointed out, away from us, away from our church, away from our building. Jesus wants you to be his witness in your Jerusalem, your Judea, your Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, to your church, to your family and friends, to those people you know and like, to those people you don't like, and to those people you don't know. And the only way you're going to do that is to rely on the Holy Spirit's power that you already have access to. Let's pray. Father, some of this witnessing, it's hard. In fact, a lot of it is really hard. We're really self-conscious. We're afraid we're going to get asked a question we don't know the answer to. We're afraid we're going to get rejected, even by our family and friends. So we rely on your spirit. We rely on his power to help us do what you want us to do, to be your witnesses, to share our story. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. It's time for some more music. Let all the earth
Again, thanks to all who helped, our singers and our techies. We appreciate all you've done during this time of COVID where we've had to do some extra work. We encourage you to continue watching our devotionals. We put them out there for you to help you through this COVID and to, to learn a few other things as well. Now, next week, next week, if all goes well this week, we'll be worshiping together for the first time since March the 15th. I know the governor uh, lifted the stay-at-home order a couple of weeks ago for churches. We took a couple of extra weeks to watch data, to get the church ready, and to make sure our process was ready. You've already received one letter telling you some dates and some generalities. You're going to receive another letter. There'll be another email. There'll be another video out Tuesday, probably, 
talking about the how our worship will be different. And it will be different from the time you hit the parking lot to walking through the sanctuary doors to sitting in the pews to walking out through the sanctuary doors and back into the parking lot. Things are going to be different. So please, watch for that information to come. And of course, if something happens this week where we don't feel it's safe to worship, next Sunday, the 24th, we won't. We'll, we'll get together and have an emergency meeting and we'll let you know if we're not going to worship together on the 24th. But right now, we are. And our services will again be at 8.15 and 10.45. And we hope you come. If you don't feel comfortable coming yet, if you still feel unsafe, please stay home. Our worship will still be on the radio, and our worship will still be on YouTube and Facebook. So please, if you don't feel comfortable, stay home. All of you, please stay safe and continue to share God's love however you can. Amen.